Well, she's finally running under her own power. I, uh, have been making some small adjustments here and there just to get it, get the chime or strike train to run correctly. Um, I have the clock shimmed with a razor blade to make it level. Because having the clock level is, is critical. It has to be level, and when you're working on it and servicing it, it has to be level at all times. Um, that way, when you place it on a surface like that shelf over there, that is perfectly level, you want it to run predictably well. Otherwise, you'll have to be making fine-tuned adjustments between your work area and the place the clock finally sits. Once the clock is level, you want it to beat evenly, like it is now. You don't want it hopping around like... Let me demonstrate. If I tilt the clock a little bit, you'll notice the beat changes. Okay, well my little my little spring wound Seth Thomas is a little more sensitive to that. <laughs> but this is a big heavy pendulum so it doesn't really appear as quickly as you'd like it to. But um, as of right now, it's actually surprisingly keeping time. Um, it's only been running for 10 minutes, so it should be at the 12. Yeah, it's right about where it needs to be. It's at 12.07 right now, so or that's I've actually I've timed it to my microwave, um, which is uh, it's not really 12.07. It's actually 11.35. But, um, so I set this to 12, and I set the microwave to 12, just to see how much time I'm losing on it, or gaining. Right now, it seems to be about right. Um, I may have to slow it down a little bit, I'm not sure yet. And that's all done through adjustments to the pendulum length. To slow it down, the pendulum has to come down, speed it up, it comes up. And then you can make major adjustments. This is a universal pendulum rod. This is not an original pendulum rod. Um, it was actually brand new when I bought the clock. The suspension and the rod are all new. So, um, you know, it had to be set to this particular clock movement um, through some major adjustments. I, I actually had this sucker keeping really good time before I tore it down. Um, it, I tore it down because it just had too many mechanical problems. The uh, biggest problem being um, this winding arbor would become disengaged from that gear in the way back that drives the, um, I believe it drives the minute hand. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, it just kept coming disengaged because there was so much play in the mechanism. And the horologist that looked at it couldn't understand why because he doesn't normally see that. And I think it might be a defect in Chauncey Boardman's factory because I had another Boardman clock movement, the one that's sitting apart on that table over there, had the same problem. So, and it's about a year or two newer. So who knows? Maybe Boardman uh, was doing a little reefer, I don't know. But he seemed to have that def defect in a couple of his mechanisms. Um... I'm not going to run the strike train right now because I, I have it set where I need it and I want to keep it going. Um, just thought I'd uh, demonstrate the unit running. But it strikes fine. It ticks and it talks fine. Now it's all final minor adjustments. What I had, I had a problem with the strike train where it would actually, um, it wouldn't strike at all at certain times. And I think I corrected that through new bushings, um, getting these arbors perfectly in line, uh, making some adjustments to the linkage. So I think this clock will do okay, but only time will tell. <laughs> One of these assholes um, is responsible for this. This is a very, very bad repair job. Now, it might not be one of these guys. It could be somebody, you know, who worked on it in the 60s or 70s or even recently. But this is something you don't want to see. 
Hole closures were... The thing about hole closures is, from what I've learned and read, is that they used to do that way back in the day when this was just an ordinary clock. You'd bring it down to your local clock shop and they'd fix it. And this is how they fixed it. When the, um, when the pivots wore out, they would just close them up and make them round again by pounding the hell out of them with a prick punch. And that was okay when these weren't antiques. And they had to just keep time, you know, so the farmer could know when to feed his chickens. And that was fine. But today, when these clocks are, these are now collectible, they're antiques, they're actually gaining in value, you don't want to see that. You don't want to do that. Let's say you, you just don't want to do that on a new restoration. On a new restoration, you want to drill out and rebush the entire mechanism. And that means drilling holes and punching in bushings which are designed for the clock industry. And every single one of these pivots has a brand new bushing in it, front and back. But back in those days where these were just, you know, utility clocks, it was okay to do that. Just make it work. So I don't have to buy a new one until next year or something, you know. And then that's that's kind of the mentality they had back then. <clears throat> but I, uh, there it is. Full restoration, July 2014. Bennington, New Hampshire, Brandon A. Bishop. And, uh, I, I used a mechanical pencil. I'm going to probably go over that with a regular... I, I didn't have a, a sharpened pencil. <laughs> I don't use them. But uh, I'm going to go over that again. But I have my name on there. So 170 years from now, somebody can look at this and say, Wow, nice job. But no, if it wasn't for the guidance of an experienced horologist, I would not have been able to do this myself. Absolutely not. Um, I still need to restring it. I'm running the old string from the other clock I had, um, which is still good. It's not broken or frayed or anything. But it's cotton, and I want to use nylon. Nylon is less likely to break. Uh, cotton, this is old-fashioned stuff. I mean, I'm going to run this clock, so I want to use something a little more durable. As for the clock face... It's going to stay the way it is. I've made that decision. I'm not going to send it out, although it's tempting as hell, and I'm, I may end up doing it later, but for now I'm going to leave it the way it is. I think it's beautiful. Um, it's part of the clock's history, and it just shows you know, how much time has ravaged this piece of equipment. But the cabinet still looks beautiful, and, um, and that's kind of the look I'm going for. That I don't want to spend a hundred bucks. So here is the clock that I've been working so hard on for the past couple of uh, probably about two weeks now. It's been it's been about two weeks, maybe three. Um, but I've done a lot of work to this poor clock. This is um, a huge achievement for me. This is my first time ever using and uh, doing any real woodworking or or fine finishing or anything of that nature. Um, but the clock, just to recap, it's been stripped, uh, repaired all the veneer. This entire section of veneer had to be replaced, and that was salvaged from a, um, a, a clock from the same maker from the same time period, uh, with the same wood grain pattern. I had to patch in a few pieces. Some of them blended in better than others, but, uh, I did it nonetheless. I sanded the entire clock down after replacing and patching up the veneer to make it look more uniform. And um, unfortunately I had to sand off the original patina, but you know what? This clock will be around in another 175 years and maybe it'll get new patina, who knows. Uh, but after doing all that I refinished it with um, a red mahogany stain from Minwax. I replaced the lower uh, tablet mirror. Now this clock originally shipped with a mirror, so I I put one back in there. Okay, Let's look at the other side, different lighting. True to the original design or the original clock um, maker, I glazed in the mirror. This is also the first time I've ever <laughs> tried to glaze in a glass panel, um, so it wasn't as successful as I'd like it to have been. But I also glazed in the original um, mirror backing. This, is, this was installed behind the mirror to prevent it from getting scratched. Um, 
and I made sure to put that back in there. It has all the signatures of everyone who's ever worked on the clock. Going back to, I believe, the 1840s. Um, I think I saw one for 1847. The clock was manufactured in around 1845 to 1846, which is why I'm now calling it in 1846. I also added my own signature to the mix because, after all, I mean, the clock's history didn't end, you know, 10, 20 years ago. This clock is still part of history and is still aging, and its life isn't over. It's still uh, a, it's a living piece, if you will. And uh, in a couple of years from now, maybe, or, you know, hopefully a long time from now, I'll be dead and someone else will have this clock, and hopefully they'll take the same pride of ownership as I did, and they'll keep it maintained. The mechanism is uh, my crowning achievement. Um, this, this mechanism was stripped down, fully disassembled, cleaned by hand, using toothbrushes and brass cleaner and uh, polish. Um, after that it was uh, examined and then each and every pivot was put on a lathe, not by me. I actually had an experienced horologist that I met through a friend um, who was trained by the late great Sherman M. Wolf of Amherst, New Hampshire and uh, who recently passed on unfortunately. I, I'm very happy to have gotten to to, to know Sherman, but um, nevertheless, his uh, his assistant uh, was able to take this mechanism um, and actually help me measure out what size bearings or bushings it needed. Um, he then took all the gears and um, filed down all the pivots on a lathe using using a precision watchmaker's file. I uh, made them nice and smooth again. And uh, the, I then took the mechanism to my dad's house where there's a nice, beautiful drill press. I drilled out all the pivots, or all the, all the, all the holes in the uh, mechanism. And I inserted properly sized bushings and pressed them in place. I did that myself. And brought it back to the guy's shop where we then looked it over once more, and uh, we had to actually make one of these bushings on a lathe. It was actually this one on the back here. Uh, that one had to be done on a lathe. That is a custom bushing. Um, it's nice to have access to this kind of equipment, but otherwise I wouldn't have been able to fix it all up. Now, I had a problem with this mechanism when I first got it. It would um, it would strike on the hour, but every once in a while it would miss. It, it would just just wouldn't start. The um, the strike train would not move. It just it would disengage fully, but it wouldn't roll. Well, I made the determination that uh, if I can find it here in my house, I know I had it here somewhere. There it is. The um, the governor flag. There's actually a term for this. I can't think of it right now. Um, which is driven by this lantern gear was starting to bind up. As it turns out, the lantern gear pins are so worn out that it just, it would bind. And I ended up taking the governor assembly off of the other clock, or the other mechanism that I had, the, the spare parts one, and I fitted it to this, to this um, clock movement. It's an identical fit. Thank God it's from the same clock maker, from the same time period, which was really cool. I was able to use that part without any modifications. And uh, it now chimes perfectly. I've had this clock running for three days, making various adjustments and tweaks here and there. And um, I now am at a point where it can be fully assembled and, and permanently placed along that shelf that I have lovingly crafted from a piece of solid oak. Let's take a look at that shelf, shall we? Shall we? Uh, come on, right. So this is the watch I've been using to uh, adjust the time or maintain the uh, clock regulation. And uh, this is the shelf I made. <laughs> the the bit or the uh, the the uh, saw blade on my jigsaw was a bit dull, 
and it ended up burning the corners as I was I had to cut these uh, these corners out with a jigsaw and it just burned the crap out of the wood but I actually I kind of like the way it came out I then power sanded the shelf made it nice and smooth um, this is a, this is a defect in the wood I, I left it there I could have sanded this out but I liked it. it it made it look more rustic you know and then I gave it a nice uh, light coating of um, I think I used uh, dark walnut stain and that's it I didn't clear coat it I didn't shellac it I didn't do any of that but there's the shelf that it's going on this shelf is uh, held in by toggle bolts it's not going anywhere I couldn't find a stud where I needed one so I had to use toggle bolts you gotta do what you gotta do but it's not put in with mollies mollies would tear out of the drywall eventually they would they'd work their way out under that kind of weight. This the clock weighs a ton, so um Oh, she just waved to me. Thanks, Leela. How you doing? Um hmm. So what did I just do? Oh yeah. I just ordered a um a ten foot roll of uh of weight cord. If I can find it here somewhere. I must have put it aside. Aha! Oop, I got caught in my boat. Let's try that again. Come on. There we go. So here's the new weight cord. This is 45 pound test nylon. This is good enough. This is, uh, this is designed for... It's actually kind of a parachute cord if you look at the way it's woven. It's pretty strong stuff. The nice thing about nylon cord is that it actually uh, can be singed really well and this is double knotted and singed. Um, the original cord would have been similar to this stuff here which is a uh, twisted cotton. This doesn't singe very well. Uh, it burns but it, uh, it can't be cauterized. And then uh, yeah, so let's do the other Okay, so leaving about two or three wraps of thread on each pulley um, we're now going to string it in, and the cool thing about these weight-driven clocks with the long pendulums is they include their very own uh, tool for hooking string through the pulley uh, pockets or shafts or whatever you want to call them. So uh, let's uh, let's get this. So we basically we're running the line right through there using the pendulum rod. It will now be draped over the pulley and then we can pull it in from the bottom like so. It's like sewing. Pretty cool, huh? Now we'll do the other one. already cut this one to length so it's uh, a little bit shorter than the uh, than the chime string just yes, like that ta-da when reinstalling the weights you never ever want to tie the string directly to the weight uh, that is bad because when you go to transport the clock, you're not supposed to leave the weights in it. It should be weight unweighted. So to do that, either make, buy, or find a set of these little handy hooks. And uh, they're great because you could just hook the weight right to it. Boom, you're done. And um, the other thing is you want to make sure that the weight can completely bottom out without unwinding the... Um, the spool completely. Um, that was the mistake that the previous uh, repair person had done to this clock and it was um, 
you know, because what would happen is it would the weight the the weight cord was too short on the chime side, so it would stop at about here. And I'm like that's just that's just not cool. That's bad. Don't. Okay, we've got the um, reproduction uh, pulley covers um, reattached with original nails uh, from the other clock that I tore apart. Uh, these are hammered um, square nails. I'll show you one right now. These are long, actually these are called cut nails, I believe. And uh, these are from 1845 to 1847. No, actually these are from 1847, I'm sorry. Um, from that other clock. So they're the same period correct nails that would have originally attached the original uh, pulley covers. So that's um, that's critical. I got the face attached. It's not perfect, but it'll do. Um, eventually, we'll probably have a new face uh, made for it. But for now, that's what's going to be on there. And now she's wearing her face again for the first time in couple of months, uh, weeks actually, um, but now it's assembled and running, which is uh, the difference here. Not bad. Was it all worth the effort? I think so. I really love the face of this clock. It, 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 it shows 170 years of wear and tear. It's part of the clock. It is the face of the clock. I don't think I could change it. I, you know, I went back and forth on restoring that clock face so many times. I found a company down south that will actually take the old, the original dial, and refinish it like new by matching the existing pattern. And I hemmed and hawed on that quite a few times, and I'm finally came to the conclusion that I just can't do that. I can't take away that character of this clock. It's, it's, it's just it's as much part of the clock to me as this historical um, you know fact sheet. I mean I can't change that and I'm not going to. It's going to stay just the way it is. Maybe someone else can restore it long after I'm dead. So, you know, I, I, uh, I'm very happy with this. It's not perfect, but it wasn't perfect either when I started, you know. Um, it just I noticed just recently that the way the uh, clock face was made, these holes weren't drilled in their proper locations, and it's just a little off-center. And But you know what? Why change it? <laughs> It was made that way by Mr. Chauncey Boardman in his factory in Bristol, Connecticut, 1846. Keep on ticking. <laughs>